Okay, with this unruly crowd, please come to order. <laughs> before, before we start, um, some, of, some of you have asked, what the heck is a category one? What's a category two other than a hurricane? And I just want to say the memberships, they're category one through category five, and they're different levels. And uh, if you look at your paper, it shows, uh, you know, sort of, it's like joining a symphony. You know, there's bronze and, 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 and silver and gold. But here, it's category one through category five, okay? If you want to be a category six, and we have a couple of them in here, please do not hesitate because we are breaking new ground here, okay? So the thing is, there are two people in the audience today, and they're gonna stand. Marissa, stand. They're collecting your forms. Just give them to, to, to them so that um, they'll be safe. All of your information is confidential and will be destroyed after we put it into the system, <laughs> except for your email address, which we'll keep. Okay, and so now um, we're going to get on with the afternoon uh, part of the conference. And um, is, is um, Wit here in the audience? Wit? Uh, Wit's, Wit's, Wit's virtual. Okay, and is uh, uh, Chris Castro? Yes, sir. Hey, Bob. Okay, just wanted to make sure you guys are here. Okay, and we will turn it over to Rick now and get started. Thank you very much. I thought I thought I was doing a keynote. You are, <laughs> you are. Okay. Hi, Ellen. You're we're, we're teeing you up right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, that was our next speaker, and she is she is doing the keynote. Uh, so just by way of introduction, I mentioned uh, when I came first came on. I'm a journalist at Yahoo Finance. We follow. Uh, our ticker search is very closely. We know uh, what companies and what stocks our audience is clicking on, down, you know, down to the single digits. And uh, can anybody guess what the top ticker usually is in terms of a company? Apple. It is not Apple. It's Tesla. <laughs> Tesla has generated unbelievable amounts of excitement among investors. Uh, and now in, the, uh, in, in finance and in business, we now have other EV companies coming behind them. Uh, the, the, the Lucid is one of them. Rivian is another one of them. These companies, I think at this moment, they're barely producing cars and they're both valued more than a Ford Motor Company is. So there's something crazy going on. Uh, investors have noticed and um, markets have noticed. So uh, that's why I think this next speaker is, is terrific. Um, so Ellen Hughes Cromwick is going to talk to us about uh, electrification and how that gets us to uh, net zero emissions by 2050 or whenever it does. Uh, she is a uh, senior fellow at Third Way. That's a think tank in Washington, D.C., very reputable one. She's also the former chief economist for the Commerce Department and for Ford Motor Company. So here you go, Ellen, over to you. Hey. Hi, everybody. It's so great to be with you, and I really appreciate the chance to talk a little bit about clean energy. I'm hoping that our IT professionals can queue up the slides for our virtual participants as well, so that they have a chance to kind of see some of the data and content as I go through the slide. Uh, are they there, Bob? And is that uh, possible to queue up the slides right now? Yes. So uh, we can advance the slides, and I will advance them for you. And all you have to do is tell me yes. OK. And can we make those accessible to the virtual participants? Yeah. They should be on right now. OK. Uh, tell me when they're, we're ready here. Her slides aren't coming up. What? We can share the slide or have her undo it. Uh, you, you, I, yeah, you just. I want. I want to do it right here. Uh, 
We're almost ready. <laughs> Institute. If she has the PowerPoint to share the screen, yeah, I encourage her. Yeah, right. Uh, Ellen? Yes. Can you share the screen and, and, and run your own? Do you know how to do that? or? Yeah, I sure do. Well, why don't we do that? Because we're having some issues okay. here. Um, I think you have to unshare before it will allow me to share. Okay, I think that you're on the screen now. Okay. Can you share now? Yep. There we go. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you, Ellen, for your patience. How's that? Does that work? That's beautiful. Okay. Hi, this everybody. Is Wow, you are a uh, so loving economist today because Matt's talk was fantastic. And Matt, if you're still there, I hope you are, uh, in case something happens and I get disconnected, Matt is there to take over. But, you know, economics uh, is often referred to as the dismal science. But today, I am really going to be a font of positivity for you. There's so many exciting opportunities ahead, and I'd like to share some of my comments with you today. Um, this is one of my favorite graphics, and this quote from Lady Bird Johnson just makes my heart sing. I mean, it's absolutely true, isn't it? Uh, we all have a mutual interest, and it is one thing that all of us share. And I share a lot with my family. On the right side, you can see a hike that we took to Half Dome. That's my daughter walking up to the final leg of that 4,817 mile round trip hike that we did. And those are people on Half Dome uh, on a cord going up that last leg. They look like ants. But, you know, that's rock, but it's still a really endearing part of our environment. Uh, on the left side, I just wanted to mention, you know, Maya Lin was the artist that designed the Vietnam Memorial here in Washington, D.C. And more recently, she's been doing a lot of work around the environment. She did a show in Grand Rapids two years ago called Flow. And I really love this because I grew up on that eastern side of Lake Ontario. And here she has a metal rendition of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. If you Google it online, you'll see the artwork. It's absolutely amazing. Well, I have three key points. I know Bob wants me to keep this very tight so that we have plenty of time for Q&A with you. The first point is something I see directly, especially when I worked at the University of Michigan Energy Institute. We had two battery labs, and I will tell you that the costs are coming down for battery technology, both for electric vehicles, but also for storing energy on the grid. The private sector financing is just growing by leaps and bounds. And, uh, you know, it is Tesla, but it's also a lot of capital flowing into battery technology and the next generation of battery tech, as well as repurposing the batteries for the grid and recycling. And then thirdly, hey, what better evidence do you need but the House vote this morning that passed the Build Back Better Act, $550 billion of climate work. 
and funding in there. And uh, again, you know, just to emphasize that is going to accelerate our transition and hopefully bend a lot of the curves that you saw in Bob's talk and also in Matt's. So what's the big picture on electric vehicles? I'm gonna use that kind of as our case study today. Uh, we got to get to 50% by 2030. No ifs, ands, or buts. We have to get there because it's the only way that we're going to set a path to get to 100% by 2035. And we need to do that because we have such a huge fleet of vehicles, 300 million cash passenger vehicles. And they last 10 to 15 years. So we can do the math. If we don't get to 100% EV sales by 2035, we won't have enough time to turn over the entire fleet by 2050 to get to that net zero. Uh, number two, we are building battery plants here in the US. And we're getting to 500 gigawatts by 2030. We're well on our way. I think we might even overshoot that 500 gigawatts of capacity by 2030. We need that because we need to have the batteries built here, made in America. We don't want to be transporting battery cells. We want to see them here and they need to be co-located with vehicle assembly plants. We're working on critical raw materials. There's some great support for that in the infrastructure package. And as I mentioned earlier, repurposing and recycling the batteries is underway. So just again, big picture, where are we? Transportation is 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. Again, I've got three tickers here, critical. We need the innovation on batteries. We need the private sector and the market forces. Both one and two are really getting turbocharged right now. And number three, we're consuming our natural capital, i.e. we're polluting or we're emitting uh, CO2, but we're not paying for it because we really don't have a carbon tax in the US. So in economics, whenever you're in a situation where you're, you're using something, but you're not paying for it, then there is a role for government policy. It's a pretty strict standard in economics that don't mess around and have the government do stuff if there isn't a justification for it. And so right now, you know, I would say to you, gosh, if we had a carbon tax or we had a carbon price, we'd have a very different policy recommendation, but we don't have it. And so we got to make up for the lost ground associated with that. We can talk about that in Q&A if you're interested, because a lot of people seem to be really interested in that piece. So this is the data on battery cells and pack prices. When, for example, when Ford Motor Company started assembling the Mach-E in Mexico, that is their fully electric, used to be Mustang, now it's the Mach-E, they had a battery cell that then they put into modules. So dozens and dozens of cells that go into a module of different sizes. And then they stack modules horizontally and integrate it into what's called a pack. So the fundamental added cost in an electric vehicle is putting together the battery cells the modules, and then the pack, which is this skateboard underneath the Mach-E. And right now, according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance, the weighted average cost of the pack and the cell together for, uh, for, for 2020 is around $135. But let me tell you something. 
the pack and the sell cost have actually come down further this year. And there are some companies that are producing sell plus pack for a dollar cost around 80 to $90 a kilowatt hour. Now keep that number in mind because when, a, when an automotive company can make an, a fully electric vehicle with a battery pack plus sell cost around 80 to 90, that means they can sell that in the dealership or on their online platform for the same price as a comparative gasoline powered engine vehicle. That is a huge game changer. And that's why Ford Motor Company announced this morning that they're gonna be producing 600,000 battery electric vehicles by 2023. So that's in two years time. So this data is lagging. These companies are pushing to this price parity with gas, gasoline electric uh, engine, uh, gasoline powered vehicles. And I love, I, I have the conversation of what's happening on the 12th floor of Ford Motor Company today. Hey, oh my God, we can make these things and it's gonna be the same or cheaper to the cost for making a gasoline powered vehicle. Well, why would we put spending into two separate platforms when this thing is cheap and now it's gonna get cheaper? So, you know, that's the question for you in the audience. You know, you get to a point in a, in a manufacturing company because margins, you know, it's a competitive industry globally. Margins get to a point where you say, well, why should I capital spend on two different types of platforms, an electric and a gasoline powered? So you get to a point where, oh, let's consolidate. And I think those are the kinds of decisions that are being made now for the second half of the decade. You know, because when you have a product in the pipeline, it takes three to five years from the concept to job one, when, when the first vehicle rolls off the assembly line. So it's a, you know, there's a time lag here, but I think those are the kinds of conversations that are probably happening. Um, hey, take a look at this. Uh, battery suppliers for EVs. Uh, the reason I wanted to show you this slide is to emphasize that we are the underdog. You know, on NFL Sunday, I love cheering for the underdog. Uh, it's fun. You know, these are, these are guys that go out there, you know, they're 0 oh, and 8 in the case of the Detroit Lions. Now they're, they're 0, 1, and 8. Um, we are an underdog on EVs. And why? Because we have 32 battery suppliers so far. We have to, we have to grow this substantially. So a lot of investment is going to flow into batteries. You know, we invented the lithium ion battery, but we, we sold the intellectual property. And uh, Japan and South Korea benefited greatly from that technology. Think ahead now, because the next generation of batteries is going to be what's called solid state. And that number 32 has got to grow for solid state batteries. Hopefully, we'll get to a point where we are the competitive leader. I think we've got the, the capital markets to support it, and we have the innovators to do it, too. That's one thing. We have tons of entrepreneurs in this field. They just need support, and we've got to you know, have that leadership and own the IP. Speaking of capital markets, I just love bringing this to you because you can see on the left-hand panel ticker symbols for fossil fuel ETFs and clean energy ETFs on the right. 
And then the black bar is the overall S&P 500. Now, I wanted to give you a snapshot, but not, but a long time series. I, I didn't want to show you what happened over the last 30 days or the last 60 days. Let's go pre-COVID to the beginning of 2020 and measure what are the returns if you owned a dollar of that ETF from January 20, January 2020 to November 15th, 2021. And I took the prices at noon Eastern Standard Time on November 15th. And, you know, this says it all. This isn't me. This is just capital markets. These are investors. And you can see the significant change in investing appetite. Um, on the right panel, you can see a headline from, this is actually a couple of weeks ago, Ford offering a two and a half billion green bond to finance their electric vehicle future. And green bond investing is growing. It's a much bigger market in Europe than it is here in the US, but we will be seeing green bonds popping up and becoming more mainstream. So for all of you investors out there, take a look at this. It is um, you know, quite exciting because a green bond has specific metrics that an issuer has to abide by in order to sell it. And those metrics refer to the way that the activity that they're funding with the green bonds will absolutely reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So they measure it, they measure the outcomes. And as an investor, you can say, yeah, if I own a green bond, I can too, I too can participate and support this flow toward reduction in emissions. Okay, let me turn from the private sector to the public sector. We have some blockbuster funding here, both in the infrastructure package that the president signed into law just recently, and now the Build Back Better, which the House passed this morning. In the infrastructure package, there is seven and a half billion dollars of funding to help build out chargers in the U.S. That money will go to state and local governments who can partner with the private sector to build out charge plugs. Those charge plugs in the infrastructure package will largely be to support our highway corridors. So to build out the fast chargers. Fast chargers are expensive. Each plug costs about $100,000 to install. A level two charger, which would allow you to charge your vehicle overnight, those cost about $6,000 per plug. So right now the Department of Transportation has sent out the formula for every state. It's posted on their website and you can see how much each state is getting to build out their chargers. There's money for battery materials in the infrastructure package. This is a, an issue of national security. I know many of you are probably well read around cybersecurity threats. Well, there are also security issues around critical materials for batteries. And our Department of Defense, along with Department of Commerce, Department of Energy, they're all looking at how do we make sure we don't have a security issue when it comes to battery materials. So, so look at that you know, in your reading when you have some time because that's another really important build out that we're about to do here in the US. Uh, now, if I had to rank these in Build Back Better, the EV tax credits are probably going to have the biggest bang for the buck 
in terms of getting to 50% EV sales by 2030. Um, what do I mean by 50%? Let me make sure I define that for you. In the year 2030, a target that the president has set out is to say of all the vehicles sold in 2030, let it be that we're trying to get 50% of those to be electric. An electric vehicle in that target is defined as a plug-in electric vehicle or a full-on battery electric vehicle. So those new and used tax credits, both for you know, regular household passenger vehicles or the commercial tax credits, that is what is going to incentivize uh, the achievement of 50%. In my latest modeling of the projection, I'm starting to think that if that tax credit package gets passed by the Senate and the president signs it into law, that we could even overachieve that 50% target. In Build Back Better, we have loan guarantees to help support entrepreneurs you know, working on batteries, any clean energy technology, advanced technology for electrified transportation, and there are grants for manufacturing plant conversions. That's just some of the few items in Build Back Better around transportation. There are others as well. So I think these are the key areas that public policy is addressing with both of those pieces of legislation. We're getting support for research uh, with a tech neutral mindset. That means, hey, the government's agnostic on, is it advanced nuclear? Is it carbon capture? Is it storage of CO2? Is it cement that sucks CO2 out of the atmosphere? You know, we're tech neutral. The private sector, you figure that out. We just want to support the research. Um, seed capital is growing. We have more incentives for innovation and manufacturing at scale. There's a lot of work and funding in workforce development in the infrastructure deal and in Build Back Better. And then, as you know, the infrastructure itself, charging and battery cell, uh, and battery pack manufacturing. So I'm going to end there, Bob. You told me I had to be really tight on time. And I am really excited about hearing your ideas and uh, look forward to Q&A. So thank you. Thank you, Ellen. That was terrific. It's Rick Newman, not Bob, who's going to uh, handle some questions here. Do we have time for some questions? So let me start with one, and then I'll invite um, anybody who wants to ask a question, please go to a microphone and um, keep it short if you can. So Ellen, while people are teeing up their questions here, I'll ask you, what could go wrong? And I'll give you an example that I saw recently. There's a forecasting firm, IHS Market, uh, that thinks there are going to be about 4,000 4, charging stations, four, excuse me, 400,000 charging stations in the United States by 2026, but they think we need 700,000. So we may have a shortage of charging stations relative to the number of EVs we have on the road. That's just one example. What, to your mind, is the largest risk factor with EV adoption? Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head. The charging build out is going to be really critical. You know, people have to feel comfortable when they're on the road that they're not going to have any problem charging. And I will say, as a battery electric vehicle owner, I had my own scare where I couldn't get to a charging station at the time that I needed to. And it did actually add additional time to my travel. What and EV do you own? I own a Tesla. Which one? I can't, I cannot, I can't get Model, have, model S or model, model 3? I have a Model 3, and I have a Mach-E on order, but, you know, it's so back-ordered, it could be months. But I guess the point is, we have to get up to about a million 
charge plugs by 2030 if we want to get to 50 to 75 percent EV sales. So there are people not only in the private sector, but the government has done the modeling on what's the optimal location of charge plugs. Because as you know, you probably see a lot, of, a lot of electric vehicles in certain parts of Florida. There's a ton in, in California, but in other states, there are none. So you have to project forward. Hey, in Montana, they're really gonna, at some point, take advantage of this purchase credit so where do we put the charge plugs? I see potential pitfalls as we roll that out, but there's a lot of work being done on that right now. One question over here. Hi there, uh, my name's Charles Reith, and uh, I am a solar owner on my home as probably many are here. Uh, but uh, in Florida, if the electricity drops during an outage, our solar, our rooftop solar stops working we're told we need a battery in our garage. And a battery is economically a little intimidating. There's no payback period. I understand there's a Ford truck coming out with V2G where you can plug your house in and have continuity. How fast do you think that will come to market? Will you be able to buy it in something other than a pickup truck? I think that's a great, thank you, Charles. Um, great question. Uh, I think that's gonna, that's gonna be um, the base or the standard technology, you know, in the back half of this decade. Uh, that Ford Lightning truck starts to hit the roads next year. And other companies are really gonna start to look at that two-way energy flow for their products. It is a major advance to have that capability to charge up your home or start uh, in, a, in the absence of a, you know, a, pow a power outage. So I see a lot, I'm watching and seeing a lot of OEMs or uh, automakers start to look at that technology. I think that's very promising. Thank you. Question over here. Hi, I'm Dr. T.H. Culhane from the Patel College of Global Sustainability, and I've been driving a 2006 Ford hybrid SUV. In my work in Sweden, I was driving trucks and cars around that were powered by renewable natural gas, biogas, that there's filling stations all over Gotland Island. And the question I have is when we have problems with our electric infrastructure, for whatever reason, grid goes down, is there a plan to have hybridity with renewable natural gas where we're sourcing food waste and turning it into a renewable fuel that is carbon neutral? Is that going to go in the production line? Or are we going to get biased away from any backups so that we're always electric dependent? Doctor, thank you for that question. They actually do have some research funding in the Build Back Better for that. And again, it's all of the above. In fact, when you look at the infrastructure package, two and a half billion out of the seven and a half billion is for all alternative fuel infrastructure. So they're not ruling out uh, sourcing uh, like that. And they want to make sure they continue to support the research because you know, there could be a breakthrough there and it could be quite economical. So um, absolutely, I don't think that that's ruled out. No one has said, oh, we have to park that on the side because we know for sure it's going to be the electrified solution. Thank you. Last question over here. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. My name's uh, Ed McCrane. I'm the emergency management director in Sarasota County. And with me is my counterpart, Steve Lachar uh, from uh, Manatee County Emergency Management. And one of our responsibilities, if we have a natural disaster, a hurricane, is to evacuate the citizens of this county. My concern with the EVs is what are your thoughts about, uh, is there any capability in, that they're thinking about of having like a mobile vehicle that charges vehicles that get stranded on the highway as they're evacuating? Because we have that problem now with gasoline. People fail to fuel up, maybe they fail to charge. So that's one of my thoughts. And I wonder if there's any thought being put towards that. Thank you for asking that question. 
I do know that there are people at the national uh, laboratories looking at that issue and the, the national laboratories like Argonne National Lab, which is uh, just south of Chicago, uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado, they're looking at these exact issues. How do we make sure that in um, a serious disruption of our ability to evacuate or whatever, that we have to have a solution for that? I don't think they have a solution as of today, but I know that they're, they're working on it. So I appreciate that you raised that issue. Can and I ask one what, of the reasons why people like the idea of a plug-in electric vehicle? Let's not, you know, put our foot down and say we can't have plug-ins because plug-ins at least give you some optionality in terms of fuel source. Can I ask a, a little part B on that? The um, quickly, these, please. These charging stations that they're going to put all over the country. Is it a rapid charge or do you have to sit there for eight hours to get your car charged up? Because that could present a problem too. Yeah, there are, two, there are two types of chargers that they're going to be deploying. One is called a direct current fast charge, which is DC fast charger or DCFC. And those chargers have different kilowatt hours. One of the standards is 150 kilowatt but now they're building more 250 kilowatt DC fast chargers. Those charge up in 10 to 15 minutes. A 150 DC fast charger charges up in about 30 to 45 minutes. So they're, they're, they are going to be deploying and installing a lot of those DC fast chargers along highway corridors. That's when you get to the charger and you might have to wait in line, right? In California, they are waiting in line and there are a lot of disgruntled EV owners yeah. there. And the state of California is trying to work really hard to expand their network. Ellen Hughes Cromwick, thank you for a, a great presentation. Good questions too, thank you very much. There's another gripe with um, electric vehicle charging, which is sometimes people go up to the charger and then they go in to have lunch. And sometimes they're done charging, but they're still having lunch while people are waiting behind them. So there's some, there are definitely some uh, like charging etiquette things that are, that are gonna become.